Okay. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we are very happy today to have Anna Bikowski and Vadim Gorin uh, 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 presenting this wonderful paper on the asymptotics of co-integration tests for high dimensional uh, VAR K processes. So uh, Anna, the, the floor is all yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, Majid, for introducing me and for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for coming. So the motivation for this talk is coming from the fact that we are currently entering the era of big data in economics. More and more high-dimensional data sets become available, and new types of data require new machinery to work with them. So in this paper, in this talk, we are going to look at the specific question and the question of testing for the presence of co-integration. And what we're going to do is we're going to analyze what happens with traditional tests for the presence of co-integrations, which were designed based on small number of time series. In the large dimensional and the high dimensional world, so when we are actually in the big data framework. And then like after we analyze what happens with those time series, I will show you, I will explain like what are the changes that we need to make in the accordance of the in the accordance with the large dimensional with the high dimensional world. So let me first uh, like define by means of examples and then formally what it means testing for the presence of co-integration. So uh, what it is co-integration, where it comes from. Co-integration is the notion related to non-stationary time series, time series with unit roots. And you can think of non-stationarity or unit roots as the, like say you have a time series and the variance of this time series grows to infinity with time. So it becomes more and more uncertain. And the covariance between today and the future never disappears. So the covariance between today and like 100 years from now doesn't go to zero, still positive. You increase the horizon, still doesn't go to zero. So in macroeconomics and finance, there are a lot of time series which have this property, for example, price level, consumption, output, trade flows, interest rates, exchange rates, and so on and so forth. So usually you either work with the data per se, or you have to take logarithms, like, like in the case of price level, because it looks like an exponent. And so it turns out if we have multiple non-stationary time series, they can have a stationary linear combination. By stationary to here, I mean that the variance no longer grows to infinity with time. It stays uniformly bounded across time. And the covariance between today and the future goes to zero as we increase the horizon. So this case is called co-integration when we have non-stationary time series and they have a stationary linear combination. Depending on whether data is co-integrated or not, it has different properties and so it needs to be modeled differently. So we need to actually know whether our data set is co-integrated or not. And plus the presence of co-integration means there is the stationary component which is easier to forecast. And that can serve as like a, some way to think of the equilibrium in the economy. So the stationary coordinate, the stationary component is the long run equilibrium of the economy. So let me show you like what I mean. Let's consider first the left picture where we have on the X axis time, monthly data from 1950 January until 2010 January. And then we have two curves here, blue, solid blue straight line and the red dashed line. Those are interest rates on the US treasuries. So the blue one is the short interest rate or the interest rate on the three months treasury bill. And the red one is the long rate or the rate on the one year treasury bill. So the one which pays you back in one year. And if we look see here, both curves had this very strong persistency. They both go up, up, up and so on for a long period of time. Let's look here again. They both look, go down, down, down for a long period of time. So that is an indication of a unit root or non-stationarity, this very strong persistency. And formally, if we do the augmented Zeke Fuller test of the null of a unit root or non-stationarity versus a stationary alternative, the p-value for both curves is 0 0.2. So we do not reject the null of non-stationarity. But if we now look at the second picture, where what we see is the spread, the difference between those two curves. Again, on the x-axis is the same monthly data, monthly time. And then this blue curve now in the second picture is much more random. It's more like just noise fluctuates up and down, up and down. And that is in line with stationary. And formally, again, if we test now the second picture, 
for the null of a unit root or non-stationary versus a stationary alternative, the p-value is way below 1%. So we reject the null of a unit root with very high certainty. So that is like what we are going to do in this talk. We are going to focus on multiple non-stationary time series. We will be trying to check whether they have a stationary linear combination, in this case, just the difference, for example, which is whether they are co-integrated or not. So how it was done in practice, there are two most traditional approaches. They are based on the large T asymptotics, where capital T number of time periods goes to infinity, and n number of time series is fixed. Like in the example, n was two, so it makes sense to assume that in this case, n is fixed and small. So the first approach is based on the regression residuals, where what you do is suppose you have 10 different non-stationary time series. You take the first one, you regress this first one on nine other time series, get residuals from this one regression, and check whether residuals are stationary or not. If they are stationary, you manage to find a co-integrating linear combination, a stationary linear combination. And that approach is due to Angle Granger and was also extended in Philips and Oliaris. Another approach is likelihood ratio, where we calculate the likelihood based under the null, say no co-integration at all, no stationary linear combination, versus under alternative, say at least one co-integrating relationship. Compare those likelihoods, compare it with the appropriate critical values, and then decide whether we are in favor of the null or in favor of the alternative. So either we cannot reject or we can reject. So it turns out that unfortunately, neither of those two approaches is used in the analysis of large systems. Why? Because they over reject the null when the number of time series is large. So to illustrate, let me show you a table from Gonzalo and Peter Akis. So what we see here is capital T is 30, so 30 time periods. You can think of annual data. And n number of time series here goes from 5 to 10. The last column, that is the empirical size of the likelihood ratio, so the second approach, the idea that numbers in this last line should be close to 5%. So we generate the data under the null, no co-integration at all. We should reject in a very few cases. But what we see here, n equals 5, we reject in 20% of the cases, 6, 31, and so on. When n equals 6 and 10, we reject in the 97% of the cases. So we are absolutely on the opposite side of the spectrum. So what it all means, in some sense, is that fixed and large T asymptotic regime is a bad fit for the cases where n is comparable to T. And the first result in this direction is the paper by Anatsky and Wong 2018, where instead of considering this traditional asymptotic regime, just T goes to infinity, they suggested considering alternative regime where both n and T go to infinity jointly and proportionately. And turns out that this alternative regime helps to explain, can explain this over-rejection, which we see in this table. So what we're going to do next in this talk, we're going to see in more detail what happens in the large T, large N world with the traditional co-integration test. We'll focus on the likelihood ratio. And then I will tell you how to correct, what to do in the actual large dimensional setting. Any questions so far? No questions so far. OK, so let me start with the introducing data generating process, which is going to be a vector autoregression of order k, a very general autoregressive process, and then go into the asymptotics and testing. If time permits, I will also discuss a bit like where all our results are coming from, what are ideas behind the theorems. And then at the end, I will show you two empirical illustrations, one to SMP 100 and another to cryptocurrency. So let's start with definitions. Say so we have xt, this is our n-dimensional vector. You can think of xt as a vector of n different stocks in one column. So price of Apple, price of Google, price of Facebook, and so on, all at time t. We say that xt is i0 or integrated of order 0 if xt is stationary, which means it has bounded variance, short range correlations, Covariance goes to zero as we increase horizon between today and the future. We, we say that xt is i1 or integrated of order one or has a unit root if xt is non-stationary. 
But first the differences delta xt, which is the difference between today and yesterday, xt minus xt minus one is stationary. So that is row invariance, long range correlations, variance doesn't go into zero, our example. So for example, interest rates in the picture, though those were the case of pi one. And then we say xt is co-integrated if it's i1. So it's not stationary, but first difference is stationary. And there exists a vector beta and dimensional vector such that we take a linear combination, beta prime x. That one is now stationary. So with the interest rates, beta was one comma minus one. So one interest rate minus another. So there can be multiple such co-integrating vectors. So we say that xt is co-integrated of order r0 if xt is again i1, and now the r r0, such different linear independent vectors, or there is n times r0 full rank matrix beta, such that we take beta prime x, this are our dimensional vector, r linear combinations, r0 linear combinations, they are all stationary. But we cannot find one more linearly independent vector, so there does not exist n times r0 plus 1 full rank matrix beta tilde, such that beta tilde prime x is stationary. So those are main definitions. Now we need to introduce some data generating process for x submodel, which we are going to use. And here we are focusing on the vector autoregression of order k written in the error correction form. So on the left hand side, we have delta xt instead of xt. Any vr can be written like this, just subtract xt minus 1 from the left and from the right. And so what we have here, we have first phi dt, that is phi as the matrix of coefficients, and dt is the d-dimensional vector of deterministic terms. So that's where we put all our trends, like intercept, linear trend, quadratic trend, whatever we want, and like seasonality, maybe some specific time effects. So all of this can go in the vector dt, in the matrix dt. Then the traditional part, the autoregressive part, we write it again in the error correction form. So we have first differences delta xt minus i here multiplied by some unknown n times n matrices gamma i, sum from i to 1, 1 to k minus 1, and then the last term pi xt minus k. So k here is our order of vr. So what we assume here is we assume that the noise epsilon is IID across time normal, with mean zero, covariance matrix lambda. A lambda can be any n times n matrix, non-degenerate matrix, which is very convenient in practice because we have no idea how coordinates of x are correlated across like, space. It can be that maybe shocks to Apple and Google are very correlated, and shocks to maybe Apple and Walmart are less correlated. We don't impose anything like this. We can have any lambda. So with this data generating process in mind, we ask ourselves, is xt co-integrated or not? Or whether there exists an n times r0 matrix beta of rank r0 such that beta prime x is stationary. Okay. So that is a complicated question because the set of vectors, the space of vectors is infinite dimensional. Uh, there, uh, there are uh, infinite possibilities of different vectors. Like uh, we have beta, and dimensional vector, so mean, uh, infinite amount of those vectors. Turns out we can simplify this problem via the Granger representation theorem, which relates the co-integration rank R0 with the rank of a matrix pi in our error correction representation. So that is the matrix we have here, which we multiplied by the last term xt minus k. So formally, if xt is co-integrated for the R0, then rank pi is exactly R0. And the other direction is true if rank pi is R0 plus there are some extra technical conditions, then xt is co-integrated of order R0. So which means we can rewrite our testing problem in terms of the rank restriction for pi. So if we want to test for the presence of co-integration, the no, no co-integration at all will be just rank of pi equals zero, where pi is identically zero matrix. The alternative, can be rank of pi between one and n. Or like we can have a very general testing problem. We can test rank of pi smaller or equal than R1 
So that in this case, the null will be um, at most R1 cointegrating relationship versus the alternative between R1 plus one and R2 cointegrating relationship or rank pi between R1 plus one and R2. So after we have rewritten our testing question in terms of rank restriction for pi, we can calculate the test statistic. We can use the traditional test statistics, which is going to be based on the squared sample canonical correlations between delta xt, first differences, and lags xt minus k, with the idea that pi here is actually capturing some relationship between those two vectors, the vector of delta xt and vector xt minus k. So let's see like, how formally the testing proceeds. What are the squared sample canonical correlations? So what we do first, we get rid of the deterministic terms and extra first differences delta xt minus one by regressing the data on delta on dt and delta xt minus i. We regress both delta xt and xt minus k. So the idea is like we want to get rid of this part in our equation and that part, and only capture the relationship between delta xt and xt minus k. So that's why we regress both delta xt and xt minus k on those terms and this terms. Okay, so we get residuals from those regressions. R0, those are regress residuals from regression of delta xt on those things, and Rk, residuals from regression of xt minus k on those things. And now we can calculate squared sample canonical correlations between R0 and Rk. So squared sample canonical correlations are just a multidimensional analog of correlation coefficient. And just like R0 and Rk are multidimensional, so they have, instead of just one correlation, multiple correlations. So what we do is by the following. We calculate sample coherences between R0, 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 R1, 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 and R1, and so on, via those matrices Sij. So i and j can go from 0 to 1, capturing the sample coherence between Ri and Rj. And then what I do is the analog of the squared correlation, which will be coherence squared divided by two variances. So here is our one variance, S0, 0 inverse. Here is our second variance, S1, 1 inverse. And here are our covariances, S10, S01. So we take the product of those four matrices, calculate eigenvalues of those four matrices. This is the same as also solving the following equation. So we order those eigenvalues in the decreasing way. So lambda 1 is the largest, lambda n is the smallest. And now we can form a test statistic based on those eigenvalues lambda. So there are multiple ways of what type of test statistic to form. Um, let me give you some kind of most traditional examples. If we test the null rank pi smaller or equal than R1 versus rank pi between R1 plus 1 and R2, we can use the Johansson's likelihood ratios test statistic, will, which will say, OK, let's take the eigenvalues from number R1 plus 1 until R2 and sum logs of 1 minus lambda i. Logs are exactly coming from the likelihood ratio. So that is the statistics you will get if you do the likelihood ratio for this new and the alternative. Another possible statistics is pillai bartlett statistics, where you do a type of a trace test. And instead of summing logs, you just sum lambdas. So again, you just like use eigenvalues from number R1 plus 1 up to R2. Now sum them instead of summing logs of 1 minus them. And another example is called telling lowly statistic, where, again, you use the same eigenvalues, just different transformation. You use lambda over 1 minus lambda. So the idea is like those eigenvalues will behave very differently under the null and under the alternative. And so those test statistics will be able to tell you uh, whether you are actually under the null, whether the behavior is consistent with the null, or it's consistent with the alternative. Any questions so far? Uh, uh, I just to clarify, uh, are you are you going to go over the assumptions on uh, the coefficient matrices as as n gets larger? Uh, okay. Yes, that is then, yeah. Then uh, yeah. Thanks. So now traditional procedures. What happens in the traditional world when n is fixed 
T is large. That is like uh, what Johansson did in his papers and also in Stock and Watson 1982. Um, one could derive limit theorems where n is fixed, t goes to infinity. It turns out that those statistics here, like all of them, will converge to various integral functions of Brown and motions. So those were widely used. Like we know we have seen that they perform badly when n is intermediate, like kind of close to t. And we know that there is this explanation by Anatsky and Wong where they suggested, okay, to improve the performance, let's do a joint asymptotics where both T and N go to infinity jointly in proportion. So that is what we're going to do. Let's see what happens with those tests under the large N, large T world. So first with this, let me define the following distribution called water distribution, which is the probability distribution on the interval 0, 1 with two parameters, P and Q, and the following density. So that is just a constant. What is important here, we have x minus some constant, another constant minus x on the square root, divided by x, 1 minus x, and we multiply by indicator of those lambda minus lambda plus. So the support of this distribution is actually lambda minus lambda plus inside the 0, 1 interval. So those are lambda minus lambda plus are explicitly given numbers here. And let's see here on the picture, we have various densities. So the blue solid line is the density for P equals two, Q equals two. It's symmetric, has two humps on the left and on the right. Here is our support. So that will be lambda minus the point here and lambda plus here. If we increase P, so now look at P equals five, Q equals two, that is the yellow, um, dashed density, what we see, the support moves to the right. So we increase P, the density shifts to the right. And the hump to the right becomes more prominent compared to the hump to the left. So like the majority, like we shift everything to the right, both the support and the humps. If we do the opposite and increase Q, that is the orange dotted density here, the other direction. So we shift to the left, the left hand becomes the most like prominent visible. Um, so for now, let's just focus on the distribution. I will later explain you where it comes from. So it turns out this distribution also appears in the co-integration test. So here is our data generating process. And here is our theorem about what happens with the co-integration test in the large NT world. So suppose that case fixed, T and N go to infinity jointly and proportionately. So the ratio converges to some constant tau, which we assume is larger than K plus one. And suppose the following condition holds about the matrices of coefficients. So we take the rank of pi, rank of gamma one, rank of gamma two, and so on, rank of all gammas, and the rank of our d-dimensional vector, like this d, the dimensionality of the deterministic terms, sum all of them, divide by n, that should go to zero. So that is like a, a rank reduction assumption. So we assume a small, like small ranks in the limit. Then what we can say is that the empirical CDF, the empirical measure of eigenvalues, those lambdas which we can get in the testing procedure and eigenvalues, that converges to the Walker distribution with the specific parameters, p equals two, q equals tau minus k, weakly in probability. So what it means? The convergence like weakly in probability means that you take any continuous function f on zero, one, and you take f of lambda, so f of our eigenvalues with the empirical CDF, with empirical measure. So each eigenvalue has a measure one over n. So that is the expectation of f of lambda that will converge to exactly the integral of f of x, mu x dx, or Walker distribution. The result for k equals 1 is also shown in an ad scale 1 2018 by different methods. So summary, like what we know from this, we know the behavior of eigenvalues. That is the delta lambda here is the direct measure, the direct delta function. So that is the derivative of the empirical CDF, empirical density. So let's first 
think about what the theorem means. What are the restrictions here? The first one like, is more just a technical restriction. The important one is the small rank restrictions. And that is like we can think of this as like our original model is over parameterized because like pi is n times n, all gammas are n times n. So we have a lot of like flexibility and a lot of possibilities to overfit the data. So we need to introduce some restrictions to avoid this overfitting. And there are two ways to do those restrictions. One is the low rank restriction, that is the one we use. Another would be the sparsity assumptions. So those two are the most traditional assumptions. We use the low rank assumption. And actually the like approximating big data with low rank matrices is a widely used and powerful technique in data science. So it's been used a lot in machine learning. It's been used in the recommender system. So for example, like when Netflix recommends you like what film to watch, what Netflix uses is it uses this like this type of low rank uh, um, approximation of the very complicated high dimensional data about your preferences. And like if we think about our like economic setting, for example, when can we expect this type of a low rank restriction? Is like for example, if we have a lot of stock prices, they kind of don't affect each other, but there are also multiple like macroeconomic indicators. And those macroeconomic indicators affect all stocks. So in this case, we'll have gammas, which have a bunch of non-zero columns. Those are columns regarding the macroeconomic indicators. And the rest will be zeros. So that is kind of some intuition of like when like, and how we can interpret this restriction. So now with this theorem in mind, what we can do is we can analyze what happens with traditional tests, because if we'll look at this sum here in the definition of weak convergence and probability, that's exactly our classical cointegration test. We have some sum function of eigenvalues. So that what we can do is like say if we work with likelihood ratio test statistic, that is the following sum. Sorry, Anna, can, could, yes. could, could I ask one quick question on the previous sure. slide? Um, on the on this rank condition, the low rank condition that you imposed, does that implicitly also imply like a low rank type condition on lambda, the variance matrix of epsilon, or is that still completely unrestricted? Uh, no, for epsilon we don't. For epsilon, it's uh, any non-degenerate matrix. So lambda is. Um, so that lambda. doesn't have to be any sparsity rank condition. Can be whatever no, it is. No, no, no. It's only about the coefficients here. The okay. noise it's outside. Okay. Well. Yeah. It's because like we kind of want to have those terms in some sense negligible. No, 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 that I that I, that I understand. That that's fully clear. I'm just surprised that there is absolutely no condition on lambda, but I guess when you go through the proof, you can maybe yeah. yeah. So for lambda, the good thing it's actually in some sense an artifact of the uh squared sample canonical correlations procedure because we have this like covariance squared divided by two variances, and that's where the lambda will cancel out. So okay. it will be like oh, incovariance, incovariance, and then invariance, invariance. So it will cancel. Nice, nice. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. No questions so far. Yeah, okay. So like what we see here is like, we can uh, characterize what happens with tests, so first, like, let's look at the likelihood ratio test, where we sum logs 1 minus lambda i from r1 to r2. That will converge to the exact integral with the water distribution density. So like we recalculate r1 over n, that is our rho 1, r2 over n, rho 2. And then we'll look at the appropriate, like how likely it is for eigenvalues to be in this interval. So that is our. Uh, f of x here, how many eigenvalues are coming from x to 1. We can do the same with the Gilai Bartlett, the sum, again, which is sum that converges to integral x mu dx. Mu is this water density. We can do the hoteling lowly, where we have sum lambda over 1 minus lambda. Again, that will converge to the integral x 1 minus x mu x dx. Mu is, again, water density. There are two cases with inequalities. That is because if 
we look at the largest eigenvalues here, we can have a very negative value. So for all finite samples, if lambda one is very close to one, that is like minus infinity. And the same here, if lambda one is very close to one, that would be plus infinity. So those are two cases where we formally have inequalities instead of equalities. But what it all actually means is that instead of convergence, converging to the some random integrals, we converge to now deterministic integrals in the high dimensional world. So let's see like how it all looks. Suppose the following data generating process, that's mm -hmm. VR of order two. With so Anna, the... Anna I, I have a small, I have a small question regarding, regarding to your condition outside the box that R1 over N, the limit is equal to row one and uh, the condition you have in the theorem. Since in the theorem, so the R1 is still uh, the co-integrating rank. So uh, no, so, uh, no, 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 that is just like how many co-integration rank is some small number R0. It's not here. It's like ah, co-integration okay. rank is this one, rank of pi. Yes, that okay. Be... But this is not the R1, okay. No, those are just oh, like okay. the Sorry. numbers of Sorry. eigenvalues we use, like say from like R1 to yeah. R2. Okay, thanks. Since I, I, I was confused how this can happen jointly. But uh, this R1 is now... Uh, yeah. something different from the rank we have in the theory. Yeah, okay, so thanks. the R1 and those will be like how many eigenvalues we use here. If we uh, test... these, are the, these are the the number of co-integrating relationships we assume in the under the null. Yeah, so that is like our null Bruce tolerance of like how mm -hmm. many we use in the test yeah. procedure. But yeah. it has nothing to do with the true data generating process. I see, I see. Because maybe like we're testing and the truth is very different. So yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. So let's see. Here we have VR of order two with n equals 150. So we have delta xt equals to a column of ones. So that is our deterministic vector plus gamma one, which is 0 0.95 E12 delta xt minus one. The matrix E12 is the matrix of all zeros except on the first row, second column. On this cell, we put the value one. So that is the matrix of rank one. And then for pi, we also have a matrix of rank one. In this case, we use a matrix where we have the first column of ones. So there's E dot one. So the first column is all ones and everything else is zero multiplied by 0 0.1 plus epsilon t, epsilon t, iid, standard normal. So for t equals 500, let's see on the first picture here, the blue columns are the histograms of our eigenvalues, lambdas, and the orange is the water distribution. So that is our theoretical limit. So what we see here is actually, yes, the blue is very close to the orange. So that is in line with our theorem. We know it works and we see it in the simulations. We increase t to 750. The columns, again, those are eigenvalues from the procedure. They change just because the data changes per set. The orange curve also changes because it depends on the ratio t over n. So t over n is now larger. And the same if we do t 1000. Again, the columns change, the data changes. And the orange curve changes because t is now larger. t over n is larger. So there's our increase in Q, which shifts all, everything to the left. So here we see the same. The support shifts to the left. So what we can see here is that the bunch of eigenvalues pop to the right and to the left of the support. So we have this eigenvalue here, a small column in the first picture, then the same in the second, a small eigen column here and there, and the same there. So what it means? It does not change our theoretical results because it's like just one eigenvalue. It has the probability one over n. So when we have those like theorems, one over n, as n goes to infinity, goes to zero. So just one small eigenvalue has a negligible probability. So it does not affect convergence and probability and weak, like, weak convergence and probability. But like in practice, we can see a couple of like eigenvalues popping to the right and to the left of the support of the orange curve. And the 
like why they appear, it's actually due to non-zero ranks of gammas and pi's. So those non-zero gammas and pi, they lead to a couple of eigenvalues popping to the right and to the left of the support. So let's zoom even more, increase t even more, or yeah, let's increase t even more to 1,500. That is the same data generating process as before, just higher t. So what's we, what we see is again, the orange curve shifts to the left. The spike here, the hump here becomes very prominent. And again, there is one eigenvalue which pops to the right. So now, like we know what happens with traditional tests in the high dimensional world. They just converge to the integral of this orange curve. But so we need to do some type of a second degree asymptotic. So we need to now understand like how to proceed in the high dimensional world, what to do, like how to test. There are two ways. Like first, like we can look at the fluctuations of the test, like how far they are from the um, integrals, from the theoretical limits here. Or what we can do is, let's look at this picture. And there is this very strange eigenvalue which pops to the right of the support. We can actually use this eigenvalue. Turns out that the presence of something popping to the right of the support something appearing here on the flat area of the orange curve. But that is an indication of co-integration. So we can potentially, instead of using all eigenvalues and how they differ from their expectation, the orange curve, use like the fluctuation of this largest eigenvalue, how far it is from the rest of the eigenvalue. So how far is this one from the support here from the majority of the eigenvalues? Okay. Before I move to the testing, any questions? Uh, no questions so far. Okay, so then let's try to do testing and let's try to use this eigenvalue, which is separated from the bulk. I guess we can see that there's an artifact of non-zero ranks. So what we're going to do is we're going to use largest eigenvalues for the coin integration test to say whether there is a co-integration or not, to say whether rank of pi is zero or not, we're going to use what happens like, in the right side of the support. We will need stronger assumptions. So first thing to do is, let's assume that deterministics is just a constant, just an intercept, so that we can rewrite our data generating process as delta xt equals to mu, that is our constant, plus what we had before, the root regression of order k part plus a noise. Okay, so we know that what we want to test is we want to test the rank restriction on pi. That is a complicated question because we have all those gammas. We know that like on average, they give us, no, we, we get those orange curves, but for fluctuations, we need something more. So orange curves are kind of low large numbers and we need CLT. So for this, we're going to introduce a proxy new, proxy alternative for our rank equals zero. And our proxy null h zero hat is going to say that not only pi is identically zero matrix, but also all gammas are zeros. So they don't have a small rank, but they are exactly zero. And so that under this h zero hat, the data generating process is just delta xt is mu plus epsilon t. So just the traditional high dimensional unit root, uh, high dimensional random walk with the drift. So I will show you formal theorems under this uh, H0 hat. Uh, we also have simulations which support the fact that results also hold under the original H0 given some conditions on ranks, like similar to the one we had for the conversions to the water distribution. So what we are going to do is now, we are going to calculate the following test statistic. Like if we go with likelihood with logs, we take first our largest eigenvalues, we modify the procedure, the original procedure just a bit, um, so that is just the technical part, which I'm skipping. But most like lambda tilde is very close to the original lambda. So we take likelihood ratio for the first 
largest for the first r largest eigenvalues we recenter and rescale and that is our test statistic so here centering and scaling are explicitly given constants there are also those lambda plus and lambda minus um, those are the same as we had in the water distribution and now turns out we can calculate the limit of this test statistics under the H0 hat, and then use the theoretical limit to get quintiles. So formally, if we want to reject no co-integration at level one minus alpha, what we do is we compare our test statistic with alpha quantiles of the distribution to which it converges. So I'm not like uh, showing the exact distribution. I'm only showing its quantiles, but there is like an exact distribution. It kind of looks like a normal hat, but it's not exactly a normal hat. In contrast to normal distribution, it has a positive skew coefficient, so it will be skewed to the right. It will have different slopes on the left and on the right of the density. So now we have the procedure, just like do the squared sample canonical correlations, recenter, rescale, compare with the quantiles. Um, so let me show you where it all comes from. Any questions before I move to the proof ideas? Can no I questions. So far. Oh, can sorry. I, sorry. Why the scaling factor into the two thirds? Where does two thirds come from? But maybe you're so, going to explain that next. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, so at two over three comes from the um, random matrix of CLT. So like what we are doing in this Theorem, in some sense, we are analyzing fluctuations of eigenvalues of a large matrix. And for a large matrix, that will be like how they fluctuate. So the idea will be like the largest eigenvalues, they will, their density will be like, you can think of being like close to the square root of X. And then like that N of, in the power two over three will come from integrating square root of X. But like that is like a very important distinction from the small dimensional world. That in the small dimensional world, we have traditional CLT where rescaling is by square root of n. In the high dimensional world, in the large dimensional world, in the traditional CLT, we have this fluctuations of eigenvalues which have this different scaling factor. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, should we move or someone else I think was unmuted? Uh, no, that was, that was me, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, so let's see where it comes from. So to get some intuition, to get the analogs from statistics, let me define one more distribution. Now actually like large dimensional distribution, distribution n times n matrices. So distribution is called Jacobi ensemble. It's a distribution of n times n symmetric matrices with two parameters, p and q. And the density of uh, should be proportional to, we take the determinant of m to the power of p minus one, determinant of identity minus m to the power of q minus one. So if you look at this, you can see that it's just like n-dimensional generalization of the beta distribution. So beta distribution will be a distribution on the zero one interval, x to the power of p minus one, one minus x to the power q minus one. So in a sense, we're doing the same just in the multidimensional setting and we are replacing x by n times n matrix and the determinant of this matrix and one minus x by the determinant of identity minus m. Okay. So this Jacobi ensemble appears in statistics in the canonical correlation analysis. So kind of something similar to what we do in the co-integration testing, because like we have seen that our tests are based on the square sample canonical correlations between like delta x and x t minus k between lags and first differences. So in statistics, when we have two independent data sets, that is where the Jacobi ensemble appears. So notice here, the independence is something which we will not have because we have lags and differences um, they both contain epsilon at some past time team. So xt minus k contains 
epsilons starting from time t minus k, and delta xs contains epsilon s. So if s is like t minus k, then they are correlated. So that will not be our setting, but it will be similar. So suppose we have two arrays of data, x, which is n times t, and y, which is k times t. Those two arrays are independent. So that's x i t is independent of y j s. And across, like inside array x, we assume that x is i i d across time, which means zero, any covariance lambda x. So that is similar to our assumption in epsilon. And the same for y. Y is I I D across time, means zero, covariance lambda Y. So again, similar to our assumption on epsilons. So now first consider a one-dimensional setting where instead of squared sample canonical correlations, we can use the traditional squared correlation coefficient. So N equals K equals one. And let's calculate squared sample correlation coefficient between X and Y. So that is the following thing. We sum x t y t squared, sum x t squared, sum y t squared. Turns out that this ratio is has an exact distribution. It has the beta distribution. Does not we do not require any asymptotics here. T is fixed. Doesn't go to infinity. Voila, that has exact distribution, beta distribution. Now, if we have a multi-dimensional setting, so k larger or equal than n larger or equal than one. We know, okay, now there are multiple correlations instead of just one. So we do the squared sample canonical correlations between X and Y. That is solving the following equation or looking at the eigenvalues of X, zero, X, S, X, X inverse, S, X, Y, S, Y, Y inverse, S, Y, X. Um, so that is like very similar to what we had in the co-integration test. So that's what we had here, very similar equation. Just now, instead of those S1, 0, 0, 0, and so on, we have sample correlations between X and Y. So we calculated this squared sample canonical correlations. Those are N numbers from R1 being the largest to Rn being the smallest. Turns out they also have an exact distribution fixed n, fixed k, fixed t, no asymptotics. They have a distribution um, of eigenvalues of the Jacobian ensemble with the exact parameters. So here is our p, here is our q. So that is what we kind of want to connect to. There are cases in statistics where there is the Jacobian ensemble. We are not in the case, we're very far because the independence assumption is not satisfied. Turns out we kind of still can perturb our procedure, create this additional source of independence, and then get back to the Jacobian sample. So formally, what we can do is, suppose that T and N go to infinity, again, jointly and proportionately, the ratio is larger than K plus one, and suppose that we have our H0 head, our proxy nu. Then we can couple eigenvalues from the test matrix. Those are our lambdas. And eigenvalues from the Jacobian ensemble with those specific parameters in such a way that the eigenvalues from the Jacobian ensemble and our test matrix are very, very close. So the maximum is smaller than one over n to the power one minus epsilon, epsilon any positive number. So here, there are two results hidden. So the first result is that we can couple eigenvalues and create Jacobian ensemble. That one is true even in fixed NT world. So that one is not asymptotical. We have the exact procedure, take our test statistic, replace some deterministic matrix with the random matrix, which kind of creates this additional sorts of independence, and we get the exact Jacobian distribution. The asymptotic part is that the eigenvalues get closer to each other. So as we increase n and t, the eigenvalues from one procedure, from the original one, and from the perturb, they get closer and closer and closer. And so from this, what we can do is we can actually use the properties of the Jacobian ensemble. And for the Jacobian ensemble, that is like what we get. The Jacobian ensemble, the largest eigenvalues, 
have uh, they fluctuate a scalar one point process. They have the very specific distribution. That is the one which we have in our tests. So that is where the one tiles here are coming. And also the empirical CDF of the eigenvalues of the Jacobi ensemble. That one converges to the water distribution. So that is like, again, another source of the result which we get. So that is where we are getting the orange curve distribution. We are like creating the magical replacement in our testing procedure to get the exact distribution. And then we're using the properties of this exact distribution, which gives us like first like low flush numbers for the orange curve. The convergence here, like that one, and all those nice pictures. And second, the testing procedure, the fluctuation of the largest eigenvalues. So something which pops up here to the right. And we compare it actually with the rightmost point of the support of the orange curve in our testing procedure. Any questions so far? No questions so far. Okay, so then let's apply all this procedure to the real data and see how it works. So first, let's apply it to stocks and S&P 100 with the idea that search for co-integration can serve as a basis of a stock market strategy called pairs trading. So the idea is like if we manage to find a stationary linear combination among non-stationary stocks, among the non-stationary prices, that is our trading portfolio. Like this linear combination gives us trading portfolio. And then we can see whether like, the current price of the portfolio is very far from the stationary mean. So then it means like we need to use when we need to actually trade. It's very, if it's very much, very larger, very much higher than the stationary mean, it's an overpriced portfolio. So we want to sell it. If the price of the portfolio, the current price is way below its stationary mean, it's underpriced. So we want to buy. It. That will be like kind of the idea behind the trading based on coin integration. So let's see whether we can do this. We use uh, S&P 100, which consists of 101 leading U.S. stocks with exchange listed options. 101 because there are actually two Google stocks. So although it's called S&P 100, there are 101 stocks. So we use weekly data for 10 years from January 1st, 2010 to January 1st, 2020, which gives us 522 time periods. And the idea is that we exclude COVID data and we exclude crisis of 2007, 2008 data so that we are like kind of more robust. And for X, we use logarithms of weekly S&P prices. Not all of those 101 stocks were observed for the entire 10 year span. So we restrict ourselves to 92, which were observed for the entire duration of the horizon. And so we ask ourselves whether S&P is actually co-integrated or not. So let's, th let's think about like, can we actually trade based on those stocks? Turns out, no, we do not reject the rule of no co-integration. For example, if we do test based on the largest eigenvalue, it has p-value around 0.22, so way above 5%, which we use for statistically significant projection. And let's see in more detail, like what is going on. So we construct a test by calculating 92 eigenvalues. That is our procedure. Let's plot those 92 eigenvalues. Those are blue columns, the histogram of eigenvalues. And the orange curve is our theoretical limit, the water distribution. So we know that under our small ranks assumption, the empirical CDF converges to the orange curve. And that's exactly what we see in the real data. So we see that our modeling, our theoretical modeling, matches what we see in the real data. And what is especially interesting is the match of the support of the orange curve and the blue columns. So they're almost identical here and there. And the fact that there is nothing to the right of the support, that is in line with the no co-integration. So we know that like we use the largest eigenvalue in our testing procedure and we compare it with the rightmost point of the support here. So in this case, they are very close. So no statistically significant rejection. If we do, that was based on the VR of order one. If we do higher order of VRs, very similar pictures. So we increase the order of VR 
the shapes of orange curve and the histograms change because in the procedure, the order of VR matters. That for like if you have VR of order one, you don't exert a regress on delta XTs. VR two, you regress on delta XT minus one. VR three, you also regress on delta XT minus two and so on. So procedures change a bit. That means the blue histograms change and the orange curve, they remember depend on the K, the order of VR, so they also change. But in all four pictures, the blue and the orange are very similar, and the supports are almost the same in all four cases, and nothing to the right on the support in all four cases. So we make the model more complicated, still we don't see any presence of co-integration. What is the intuition for all of this? As like kind of no arbitrage, no free lunch. What could be traded is already used and exploited. So if there would be a possibility to trade based on co-integration, some would have already used it and it would disappear in such an efficient market such as like traditional stocks. So now let's do the other market. Let's do a more novel market with cryptocurrencies. Can I so ask a question? Yes. Uh, sure. So a bit puzzled about the distinction between H not hat and H not. Uh, so have we now not rejected, failed to reject H not hat or H not basically? And and because yeah, that, so the latter would apply for four K, right? Mm -hmm. okay. That's a good question. So formally, the theorem is under H zero hat, but uh, simulations suggest that it's like really a proxy. So our limit also holds when we have H0 instead of H0 had with some small ranks. Okay, so there's not, not a risk of, let's say, spurious rejection when actually some of those uh, gammas are non-zero rather than the pi, so to speak. So if you believe that gamma can have a like full rank, then you're in a problem. Okay. Uh, but something like small ranks, that's probably still fine. Thank you. So let's see the cryptocurrency. Here is the daily data with 25 cryptocurrencies from Kilber and Junk on co-integration cryptocurrency dynamics. This picture shows log prices for those 25 cryptocurrencies for two years. So we can see some type of a call movement between those 25 cryptos. Like say here around 2018, they all go up. And that is potentially an indication of some type of co-integration, this type of call movement. So we ask ourselves the same question. Do co-integration relations exist among cryptocurrencies? And let's do the procedure and see what it tells us. So again, we have VR for the one, two, three, and four. The blue columns are histograms from the cryptos and the orange is the water distribution. So now we see that there are a couple of eigenvalues which pop to the right of the support, both for VR of order one, two, and three, four. So for all of them, there is something which pops to the right. This doesn't affect convergence to water just because they have a negligible probability in the limit, but that is what we actually use in the testing procedure. So largest eigenvalues are very far from the support. And if we do a test based on the largest eigenvalue, the p-value is way below 1%. So we reject the null of no co-integration with a very high certainty. Um, and like the amount, the number of eigenvalues which pop to the right of the support, that's kind of an indication of how many co-integrating relationships there are. So that is an indication of like what is the rank of pi. But for that, we don't have a formal theorem. So that's an interesting open question, how to then do a next step. And after you reject the null, how to find out how many eigenvalues there are. So with cryptos, we see that probably there are three. And the intuition for this is the cryptocurrency market is a fairly novel market compared to traditional stocks. A lot of firms are not allowed to trade on cryptos. A lot of people trade on cryptos just for fun. So there may be a lot of inefficiencies. And the presence of co-integration can be one of such inefficiencies. So to sum up what we have seen in this talk, we have seen a test for co-integration for VRs with comparable NNT. I haven't shown you, but actually this test will have a desirable empirical size, not like over rejection we have seen for the traditional test. We have analyzed asymptotic properties of the test. We have seen what happens with the traditional test in the large NT regime. We have seen like how to like readjust the procedure and readjust the critical values and asymptotics 
in accordance with the high dimensional world. And we have seen that like all of this together bridges together econometrics and random matrix theory, which I believe opens new directions and creates new tools for future research. So we have seen Jacobi ensemble, Walter distribution, and A1 point process, I haven't shown you exactly, but that is the theoretical limit of the test statistic. So those are random matrix objects, which appear in the econometric setting. And we have seen how to apply those tools to stocks in uh, S&P 100 and to cryptocurrency. We have seen that the results are very different. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anna and Vadim, for a wonderful presentation that was really amazing. Uh, let me just stop the video.